It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we are once again in our family room. It's turning into Gilbert Studio Number One, and we we hope that you enjoy it. We really like this room, and so we thought we want to share the room that's our favorite with you. And one of the things I love about it is the fireplace. Absolutely. So uh, welcome to our family room. Hope you've got your uh, coffee, tea, or whatever. Oh your yeah, you got you. And, and you don't uh, need to wear shoes. I'm not wearing any shoes. <laughs> and just join us as we sit and go through uh, the Word of God each week, which is um, really our, our, our favorite time during the week is it, uh, going through and the discoveries that uh, we are led to during the week. And we started that by doing the Gilbert House Fellowship. So if you go, go to gilberthouse.org, you're going to find all of our stuff there, mm-hmm. including links to the various .tv pages where we have Unraveling Revelation and Sci Friday. Um, you course, also will notice, I just want to point out, that you can see out the window that goes onto our deck. So if you happen to see a hummingbird go past, it's because <laughs> we got lots of them out there. Yes, it's a wonderful time of year when the hummingbirds show up here in the Ozarks uh, because they're shortly followed by the Baltimore Orioles and the Orchard Orioles. Oh. Oh, and, and the St. Louis Cardinals, we've got all, the Blue Jays, we've got <laughs> Major League Baseball out here in avian form, which you, is really, really fun. You wouldn't fun. think so, but yeah, we do. It's pretty cool. Uh, but today, we, we talked last week about uh, the, the beast and, and the man of sin, and we, we even said we will talk about the mark, but then you said, oh, wait, let's talk about something else. So The image, yes. This week, yeah. yes, the image, that's right. We are going to talk about the mark. One of the most highly debated things over the last 2,000 years, there are Christian theologians, and in fact, I will read from one today in the second century who was uh, trying to decipher what exactly this means and who it refers to. Well, we're told to decipher it, to calculate it, to determine what the number of the beast means. Mm -hmm. And so it's a riddle that we've all been trying to figure out the answer to. And I believe that as we approach that moment when those things actually happen, that we will understand it. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, the Holy Spirit will open our eyes and hearts to what it means. Yeah. But uh, until that time, we're uh, we're sort of iron sharpening iron as we try to figure it out. Uh, Clearly, with uh, the... The, the fact that it hasn't been resolved for 2,000 years, I doubt we're going to get to it in the next 22 minutes, no. but we will do our best to at least share some of the thoughts that uh, more uh, learned men and women have. Uh, well, yes, I like the way that you say you're going to read from the 1st, 2nd, 3rd century, those early uh, prophecy scholars who had inheritance from Polycarp and right, men like right. that. Um, but we also, as we approach those final moments uh, of life as we know it, um, I, I think that we're seeing technology sort of open up what some of this may mean. Yeah, yeah. Aspects of Bible prophecy that could only be fulfilled, or let me, let me rephrase that, could plausibly be fulfilled with technology today that could not have been in previous generations. Well, I have no doubt that God can supernaturally make things happen, like appearing to all people, every tribe and nation at the mm-hmm. same time, supernaturally. Table, sort of but it could also be, for a skeptic, an eye-opening thing to say, do you realize that with your mobile phone at a 5G or 4G connection, you mm-hmm. can stream an event to the entire world at once. How could Daniel or John have known that? Exactly. Well, we're going to get to the older stuff first, and then we'll look at the more modern uh, interpretations. Sure. Uh, beginning in Revelation 13 at um, 
you want to go back and uh, start with the the uh, the second beast and performing great signs and so yes, forth? Yes, go and right ahead. Starting at verse 13 again, it performs great signs. Now, this is the second beast, the one who speaks like a dragon but looks like a lamb, uh, the false prophet, in other words, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Now, verse 16, here's we get into new territory. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. Right. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Yeah. And that's the big, uh, th- that's the big tease, you might right, say. Right, right. Before you get into the very early interpretations of that verse in Revelation, mm-hmm. let me go back to Ezekiel. Ah, yes. Ezekiel chapter 9. We can't assume that we know what the word mark means, Exactly. Can we? Yes. Ezekiel chapter 9. Then he cried in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north. Mm -hmm. They came from the north. enemy from the north, yep. Each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen with a writing case at his waist. Hmm. And they went in and stood before the bronze altar. Now the glory of God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen, who had writing case in his hand, uh, sorry, writing cased at his waist. And Yahweh said to him, pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. Hmm. And to the others, he said, in my hearing, the others would be those who came through the north gate, pass through the city after him and strike. Your eyes shall not spare, and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Now, the mark that they're referring to here... Um, is probably the towel. The Tav, the, Tav, sorry. Yeah, the Hebrew letter Tav, which was the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet, mm-hmm. shaped in the ancient script like... Either like an X or like a plus sign. Uh huh. Almost like a like cross. cross. Yeah. Very interesting. And it means actually sign. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. But it can also be interpreted, as according to some rabbis, as meaning Dan, which is all really odd. But that means judge. Yeah. It was used by Jewish groups in the Second Temple period as a mark of righteousness. But because of the similarity to the shape, of the cross after the first century it was disused in rabbinic judaism now that's really interesting yeah yeah. there are a number of things that uh, were discontinued or disfavored after the first century the the idea for example of the second power in heaven the angel of yahweh being yahweh but not yahweh because christians right the name christians were saying we know who that angel was uh that was not a popular view in uh, am- amongst no it isn't but it is used today right. to witness to jews and and many of them accept messiah mm-hmm. well that's very interesting that comparison to ezekiel that's also very similar to those who are sealed with the mark of god in their mm-hmm. forehead in revelation 9 when mm-hmm. the abyss opens up and the things from the abyss the which is why i read it now yeah. when i was reading through this the other i was trying to find old testament examples where there is a mark and mark usually means sign but can also mean the target that you're going towards so that's our english word mark but it's a different hebrew word but then i started asking myself you and i talked about it what was the mark placed upon cain he was marked for a different reason. Hmm. 
he was marked so that no one would come and kill him. Right. But he wasn't marked because he was righteous. No, no, just the opposite. Mm-hmm. That's a really interesting I know, and I question. don't have an explanation for it. Yeah. But if you were sitting out there thinking the same thing, well, you know, our brains clearly work alike. What's even more interesting, and this is one of the limitations of English, the word seal of God in their foreheads of the mark, and we, I need to go back to Revelation 9 and, and look that up, because it is not the same Greek word that is used for the mark in Revelation 13. Oh, that's really interesting. Yes, the word in Revelation 13, translated mark, is only used there, also used at one point in Acts chapter 17 to refer to an idol. Well, it can mean a graven idol, mm-hmm. or it can mean a mark that's sort of inscribed on your on your hand or on cattle. We, we, uh, okay, almost yeah, you like can you've brand been branded. Hor- right. Yeah, like branding horses. But you know, we see it twice in Revelation 13, and it's referenced again in Revelation 14, 16, 19, and 20, but always in the same context, those who receive the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Mm-hmm. But in Revelation 9, it's it's different. Well, while you're the looking for... The seal of God. Okay, so it's not a mark. It's it's a seal. Uh-huh. Which is a different, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a different term. So there's a different connotation here. It's like it's deeper than we, we think. We, we tend to think it was just sort of a scratch or a mark, like somebody takes, okay, I'm going to take a, a, a pen and I'm going to write. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get a, a, a tattoo or something. But there, there's something supernatural about the protection of those who are um, guarded by yes. God. During that period, that five-month period when the, when the abyss opens up. And why the head and the hand? We'll get to that after you give your, mm. your talk about your little presentation. <laughs> well, again, there are a number of, of schools of thought about what this, this mark could be, and we'll get into some of that speculation here in a bit. But the uh, second century theologian Irenaeus, uh, who was the bishop of the city of Lyon in, in France, mm-hmm. He was a student, you mentioned Polycarp, he was a student mm-hmm. of Polycarp, and Polycarp was a disciple of John the Revelator. Exactly. So this is only two generations removed from John and his revelation. Irenaeus is one of the earliest commentators in Christian theology on the book of Revelation. He speculated that the number 666 could be um, at looking at the gematria, and what letters can add up to that number 666. Latinos, L-A-T-E-I, N-O-S. As in? Latins. The as Romans, in the Romans. Yes, right. exactly. It has the number 666. It is a very probable solution, this being the name of the last kingdom of the four seen by Daniel. So he interpreted the four beasts by Daniel. Right. The fourth one being the kingdom of the Romans. Coming out of the toes. Right. For the Latins are they who at present bear rule. I will not, however, make any boast over this coincidence. Titan, two. Titan, the first syllable being written with two Greek vowels, E and I, among all the names which are found among us is rather worthy of credit, for it has in itself the predicted number and is composed of six letters, each syllable containing three letters, and the word itself is ancient and removed from ordinary use, for among our kings we find none bearing the name Titan, nor have any of the idols which are worshipped in public among the Greeks and barbarians this appellation. So in other words, he is speculating that the name of the Antichrist, 666, is Titan. You write about this in your brand new book, The Second Coming of Saturn. Yes. In fact, I argue that uh, the Titan called Saturn or Kronos is, in fact, the destroyer, Apollyon, Abaddon, who comes out in Revelation 9. In fact, uh, our friends at Skywatch TV, as we're still part of that uh, that crew, we have a, we have a special offer on the book right now at the Skywatch TV store, and they've given us permission to tell about it. So we'll tell you how to take advantage of that in a special 13-week video teaching that goes along with the book. And we'll come back with some of our thoughts on what the mark might be when Unraveling Revelation continues. Deep in the earth, the dark god plots and waits as the day is coming when he will be released from his chains to loose literal hell on earth. This most terrible time in human history is known by the ancients as Old Saturn's Reign. Skywatch TV is proud to present the Saturn's Reign Prophecy Package. When you order Derek Gilbert's new book, The Second Coming of Saturn, and Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker's book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy from the Skywatch TV store, you'll also receive Derek's mind-blowing 13-part video study guide for his new book, The Second Coming of Saturn on DVD, packed with paradigm-shifting 
shocking revelation and a running time of over four hours. In his book, The Second Coming of Saturn, Derek speaks of a new age that began December 21st, 2020. Many experts pointed to the cosmic anomaly known as the Great Conjunction, a meeting in the sky of the planets Jupiter and Saturn, as the triggering event, heralding a new golden age ruled by Saturn, the old god who once reigned over a world of peace and plenty. But it's a lie. In this groundbreaking book, you'll also discover why Lucifer is Saturn, not Satan, evidence that Saturn was the leader of the rebellious sons of God, the identity of Apollyon, the angel of the bottomless pit, the connection between Mount Hermon and the Mount of Olives, hidden Bible prophecies of God's final judgment on Saturn and the Watchers. Also included in this special offer, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker's new book, 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy, where he details his upbringing as a young Jewish man confronted with the truth of Jesus the Messiah, and how he unknowingly stumbled upon the ancient and primordial prophecy that is connected to every major prophetic event in Scripture. In 315, The Genesis of All Prophecy, you will learn how God's very first prophecy impacts every chapter of Scripture, see the catastrophic consequences of Satan's plan to eliminate the Jews, recognize how Satan's insidious and pervasive agenda has invaded every sphere of influence, be empowered by the Holy Spirit to play an important part in defeating Satan's diabolical agenda. But that's not all. In this must-have collection, you'll also receive The Second Coming of Saturn 13-Part Study Guide. In this exclusive DVD, author and researcher Derek Gilbert personally takes you through all 33 chapters of his new book, The Second Coming of Saturn, and provides a deep dive into his research, including complete chapter breakdowns with ancient artifacts, maps, and other teaching devices. This tool provides hands-on access directly from the source. Sold separately, these items hold a retail value of over $70. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. So unearth the ancient prophecies of our Messiah and the rebellious dark gods as you discovered the second coming of Saturn. This collection is available only while supplies last, so don't delay. The Saturn's Reign Prophecy Package, available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order now or call 1-844-750-4985. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we're so very glad that you're choosing to use our programs, our little programs, to study sometimes in your your Bible study classes and your Sunday school classes, uh, just women or men who get together and study together. I love, love, love that. Um, we've been doing this now for almost three years. Mm, mm-hmm. This is program number 137. Yeah, we'll end up seven years <laughs> on the book of Revelation, strangely <laughs> enough, because we're only about halfway through. Yeah, but uh, it is a blessing to be able to do this because we learn things each week. Uh, we, I was just telling uh, our friend Joe Horn about this the, the other day when well, we yeah. discussed the image of the beast, how as we were going through and looking at other uses of the Greek word translated image in the book of Revelation, that... Uh, Boy, that's a whole different sense of the word than I had coming into this week's study. Yes, very much so. And as we have talked in the past, you and I, human beings, were created to be imagers of Yahweh, of the Creator, of God Almighty. And uh, that's not just our idea. Mike Heiser has taught that. And so much of we what we have learned is rooted in... In Mike's teachings. Absolutely. So when we uh, go through the book of Revelation, we come up with some different ideas. It's not that we're trying to find new, strange ways of interpreting the Bible. We're trying to get back to the way the uh, apostles and prophets understood the teachings of the apostles and the teachings of Jesus Christ and what they had been given through the the, the scriptures of old. Exactly. So yes, the sign, the seal, they're different things. Yeah. And the mark would appear to be something that will uh, that is tied together with the worship of the beast. Well, I would argue that the forehead and the hand have a couple of meanings to them, at least for me. One is that in the Old Testament, the men were told to wear frontlets, mm-hmm. a sign, yes. and they also had something on the wrist, did they y- not? Yes, exactly. The uh, phylacteries. Yes. Or the tefillin in, yes. in Hebrew. Yes. One in the hand. They, they were to bind it upon their foreheads mm-hmm. and upon their, their, their this hands. This is your thinking and your actions. Exactly. And so this is an abomination, mm-hmm. a twisting of that. And that, I think, is what's behind this idea. Yes. I would argue that, and we can get into this when we, we may not be able to get actually everything this week, but 
getting to the modern interpretation of how this may play out, I think it it very much that Mark will affect how you think Mm -hmm. and how you act. That's possible. Um, I mean, there have been a number of theories that that have been put forward in in recent years with the um, development and the rollout of UPC codes, Mm -hmm. those little barcodes that are on every product everywhere. I mean, those started when I was in high school. Even on the back of our stuff, yeah. When I was in high school, right. the pastor at our church in Little Dupont, Indiana, he, Brother Dave, was take looking at that, and he was saying, "Look, right there on it, it has six on the end, mm-hmm. six in the middle, and six at the other end." Right now, why would they do that? I I don't know. I I've read explanations by engineers saying, no, this is just a system that they developed to make it easier for the scanners to read. Okay, fine, but why do it? Uh, somewhere... You could have put 777 on there, 222, two, right. two, whatever. Right. I, I think somewhere uh, in the spirit realm, mm-hmm. the pr- a principality or power somewhere is laughing. He maybe got a bonus because he oh. <laughs> managed to get that worked into, worked into human so- I, society. I think so too. And even back then, we assumed that's what it's going to be. And and as recently as five years ago, many of us thought the same thing. But it, we're, we're seeing devices that can actually be injected and implanted. So yeah. it may be more than that. Right. Um, it is possible. And, and I know there was some question when the pandemic hit mm-hmm. in 2020. We talked about it on Skywatch TV as to whether the um, response to that. I'm being careful with my words just because I don't want to get this Bible study I wouldn't canceled. even go in there. Yeah. I wouldn't even go with that because I think that that's a distraction. I, I, well, I agree it is. I agree. I think there is a um, there a lesson from the way this is being rolled mm-hmm. out. I think there'll be some sort of global crisis that will cause people to demand a global government to, to rise up. And, and I agree. S- and the Savior will present himself to the world as the one who mm-hmm. solves all their problems, and of course, he'll turn out to be uh, the beast. But digital currency, central bank digital currencies, might be one way this mark is rolled out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Guy Malone, our friend in Roswell, uh, gave a presentation for Skywatch TV's last virtual conference on Bitcoin, and um, under the title, Is Bitcoin the Mark of the Beast? And he, he argued no, because it's decentralized. It's not under the control of one central authority, but it's going in that direction. Di- right. Central banks, 90% of the central banks around the world are investigating, researching, and developing mm-hmm. their own digital currencies. Yes. And all you need then is a crisis to say, you know, we need to put all of these currencies under one central control in the hands of the United Nations, World Economic Forum, mm-hmm. whatever. Uh, and there you go. You've got no more financial privacy and uh, because a central digital a central bank digital currency not only would track everything you buy and sell it could also prevent you from buying or selling certain forbidden categories of products religious mm-hmm. uh, instruction manual r- religious literature like bibles mm-hmm. um, religious education paying for your child's schooling for a christian education uh, things like that could be blocked by a central bank's digital currency but your behavior could also uh determine whether or not you are allowed to buy or sell if you don't like the correct things on social media if you dislike mm-hmm. something if you say the wrong comment sure if you make a post that is contrary right now in china we are seeing this very thing it's called wechat um, yeah, the yeah. App that social they have. credit scores. Nearly everything is done on WeChat in China, and it allows this behavior to be controlled by the central government. And as we are seeing, I think there is a test going on in China right now that will affect the entire world. So don't dismiss what's going on there, because cities are being locked down that don't need to be locked down. And if you have even one or two cases, suddenly an entire neighborhood is locked down, then the entire city. We're talking tens of millions of people. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, there may be some politics being played there because apparently there are certain cliques within the Chinese Communist Party who don't necessarily play ball with uh, President Xi and uh, their regions, uh, Shanghai in particular, are the ones that are being locked down. Not mm-hmm. sure why Beijing is undergoing the same thing. Well, that's but the interesting thing that they're about to... Yeah, Beijing is getting locked down. This right. may be old news by the time this plays. Sure. But the social credit score and tying that to a central bank digital currency, that could conceivably be a mark, especially because in Scripture, in the book of Revelation, it is tied specifically to the ability to buy and sell. I agree with that. Yeah. I think you are so, so right on that. And 
because of that, I don't think it's some... First of all, we have said this many, many, many times. The mark cannot be... It will not be given to you or to your children without your uh, ability to say yes or no. Will not be forced on you. Yeah. It, the Lord will not abrogate. He will not remove your ability to have free will choice. That's the whole point. That's why it says, and worships the beast. That right. implies free will choice. Yeah. The, we, every now and then we will get questions like that. What if I'm in an accident and in a mm-hmm. coma and my family thinks they're doing me a favor by putting the mark on me? Will I be eternally damned? No, right. no. You must choose yourself. God created us all with free will and he will not take away your ability to choose. This and is something that people must choose. Here's the other side of that. If you know Christ as your Savior, we are told that we get marked too. Yeah. So how can the beast system mark something that's already been marked by the Lord? I go back to Ezekiel 9. Right, right. They marked those who were weeping and moaning because of the sin in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. We... Uh and we find the supernatural aspect of that type of mark in Revelation 9 again, those mm-hmm. who are sealed by God and protected against that horrific event during the five-month period where those things from the abyss, the watchers in our view, are uh, tormenting humanity. Uh, wh- one of the comments that, that Irenaeus made, which I think is a bit of wisdom that we could learn from you know, 1,800 years later, Irenaeus wrote this, and I think this is so important, and we have this tendency as Christians to play the game, you know, f- you pin the tail on the antichrist. <laughs> he wrote, quote, we will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of antichrist, for if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision. Yes. For that was seen no very long time since, but almost in our day towards the end of Domitian's reign. Yes. In other words, less than 100 years before Irenaeus wrote this in the second century, John had the vision, and if we had been meant to know it, the Holy Spirit would have revealed it to John and said, write this down so everybody knows. But no, it's not Nero. It's not any recent American president. Uh, We've talked in recent episodes about who we think the spirit behind the human we call Antichrist will be. But again, we make no... um, we do not incur the risk of pronouncing positively <laughs> as to the name of Antichrist. <laughs> because we simply don't know. We don't have enough information yet. Yes. But we can know those who are in league with that spirit by their fruits. Mm-hmm. Follow the gospel. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as Paul wrote, in, by so doing, we fulfill all of the law. That is so true. Except Christ is your Savior now, there is no guarantee of tomorrow. So no matter how you think it's going to play out, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, you want to be ready to go now. Amen. Thank you for watching. This is Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at unravelingrevelation.tv and gilberthouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship. Join us as we study the Bible every week, verse by verse, in chronological order.